lecture number six. Uh, we start with lec this lecture uh, speaking about uh, normal microbiota of humans or we can say a uh, normal microflora. Uh, so first we'll go through different surfaces of human body and uh, we'll talk about what kind of microorganisms can be found on those surfaces as a part of normal microbiota. Uh, the second part of our lecture, uh, on the second part, we will talk about infectious diseases or infections. Uh, we'll talk about seven virulent factors. Uh, means we're going to talk about uh, what uh, pathogens uh, have to be able to do in order to cause infections. And uh, at the end of this lecture, we'll talk about epidemiology. All right, let's start with normal microbiota. Throughout ev our evolution, we developed an intimate and a complex relationship with microorganisms. Hundreds of species of bacteria and fungi live on our surfaces, some of them permanently, others are just temporarily. Even when we are healthy, the number of microorganisms living on our surfaces is 10 times greater than the number of human cells we are made of. So let's talk about where normal microbiota or flora can be found on human body. Microorganisms normally present only on the surfaces of our body. What are those surfaces? Those are external sur surfaces, for example, skin, mucous membranes of eyes, or external surfaces. And those are mucous membranes of nose, mouth, intestinal tract, vagina, and uh, urethra. Please remember, if microorganisms found in any other places, for example, in the brain, or muscle tissue or in the heart of the patient. There is not an example of normal biota. That means that patient has some kind of infectious disease, some kind of problem. There are different types of normal microbiota. First type is called resident biota. Each surface has particular species, but combination and the size of population may vary from person to person. Also, please remember, as we grow or become older, the resident biota might change over the time. The second type of uh, normal microbiota is a transient biota. Microorganisms uh, from this group do not stay with us all the time. Those organisms usually attached to the surfaces of skin or mucous membranes by oil or dirt and every time when we wash our hands or take shower we remove transient biota from our surfaces. Most of those organisms from transient biota are not pathogens. They're not harmful. Some of them can be slightly pathogenic, but for healthy individuals, they usually do not cause any problems. But as a medical workers, you have to remember, when you work with your patients, a lot of them will be immunocompromised. And what is a normal or slightly pathogenic for you can be very serious and pathogenic for your for the patients. That's why it's so important to wash hands regularly when we work with our patients. And uh, the last group of normal microbiota um, are opportunists. What do we call uh, opportunistic microorganisms? Opportunists are part of normal microbiota, but when they're given opportunity, they can cause infections. 
and some of those infections are can be very serious and sometimes life-threatening, especially in immunocompromised patients. As an example of opportunist, we can use, for example, uh, Candida albicans. You already know this yeast. It's a part of normal biota in different areas of human body, but at the same time, when it's given, given opportunity, it can cause yeast infection. Another example, uh, for another example, we can use a C. diff or Clostridium difficile. Clostridium difficile is a part of normal biota of human gastrointestinal tract, but when it's given opportunity, it can cause very serious, life-threatening, very stubborn diarrhea. So, uh, what kind of factors can cause opportunistic infections? Number one, breakdown in immunity. As an example, we can use patients with AIDS, patients that go through chemotherapy and radiation, Elderly patients or newborns also belong to a group of um, immunocompromised patients. Certain medical treatments, for example, a treatment with broad-spectrum antibiotic. Uh, keep in mind, broad-spectrum antibiotics are usually uh, strong antibiotics, and when we use them to treat certain bacterial infections, uh, they kill a normal biota of uh, patient's gastrointestinal tract. And when coliforms, this is what we call normal biota of GI tract, when coliforms are killed, then opportunistic microorganisms, for example, C. diff, can cause very serious problems, diarrhea. And the last example, implantation of devices, for example, catheters. Please remember, Number one, nasosomial infection today. Nasosomial infection means hospital-acquired infection. So, number one, nasosomial infection today is UTI, urinary tract infection, in catheterized patients. As I said, as we grow, develop, and then become older, our normal flora can change. For example, when baby gets a first teeth at six months, it changes completely normal biota of the mouth of that child. Because Streptococcus species, for example, can use the um, surface of the teeth as, as the area where they live. Another example, you probably remember that uh, breastfeeding is essential for newborns. Why? Because breast milk supports growth of bifidobacterium species in the child gastrointestinal tract. Why is it that important? Because as bifidobacterium species grow and multiply, they metabolize sugar from the breast milk into acidic and lactic acids. It means bifidobacterium species create acidic environment in intestines of that, ch of that child. And that is very important for the health of that child. Why? Because GI tract pathogens do not like acidic environment. As they grow, they actually create alkaline or basic environment around themselves. So when bifidobacterium species create acidic environment in GI tract of the child, they keep GI tract pathogens away from the child. They protect health of that child. Next example. Some hormones can change our biota in different areas. For example, estrogen. You have to remember that estrogen in adults uh, supports growth of lactobacillus species in vagina. And lactobacillus species create again acidic low pH in this area. This way, those bacteria protect women from vaginal infections. So, let's say the female child is born 
estrogen can cross placenta. When it crosses placenta, it actually supports growth of lactobacillus species in that newborn girl in vagina. So for two, three weeks, for the first two, three weeks of the life, that girl will be protected from vaginal infections. In two, three weeks after child was born, estrogen will leave system of that girl and that means vagina becomes alkaline again. And then when that girl goes through the puberty and starts producing her own estrogen, the growth of lactobacillus species in vagina will be reestablished again with the help of estrogen and the vagina becomes acidic again. So that means that girl is protected from vaginal infection and she is actually ready for adult life. Uh, the next term you have to know for your uh, uh, coming exam is symbiosis. Symbiosis refers to two kinds of organisms living together. There are different types of symbiosis, uh, but for this class you have to know the three main ones. The first type is called commensalism. Please remember, commensalism is an example of stable symbiosis. As an example of commensalism, we can use a human and a human's normal biota. So what is it commensalism? Commensalism means one partner benefits and the other is unharmed. So when normal microbiota lives on our surfaces, it has a lot of uh, nutrients, a place where they can live, but they do not produce any uh, problems for us, do not cause any infections. So that is an example of commensalism. The second type of symbiosis is a mutualism. This is another example of a stable symbiosis. And in mutualism, both partners benefit even more. Very often, they cannot survive without each other. And the last kind of symbiosis is parasitism. Parasitism is an example of unstable symbiosis. Why is it unstable? Because when we have par parasitism as a type of symbiosis, it means host is harmed and parasite benefits. As an example of parasitism, we can use human and pathogens that cause infections. For example, protozoa, worms, insects. So when we get infected, there are actually two ways we can go from there. One way, human reads of parasites means recovers from infection, or the other way, we eventually will be killed by parasite or pathogen, and this way, this symbiosis ends up. So that's why parasitism is an example of not stable symbiosis. Uh, on this slide, once again, you see uh, three types of symbiosis you have to know in the first column. Mutualism, commensalism, and the parasitism. And the rest of the uh, columns of this chart just give you um, the main characteristics of uh, each type of symbiosis.